So we're going to look at an example of uh, a confidence interval. So this is um, a confidence interval for mu using t to do it. Okay. It's 99% confidence. We have a normally distributed population, so we don't need to check that. We've got simple random sampling. We don't need to check that. Here's the sample size 16. Here's x bar is 21.63. Here's s 3.96. Here's the formula for the confidence interval. So we need to find the t value. I've got t here. It's 99%. So alpha over 2. 0 0.005, so alpha is 0 0.01. Okay, so and I've got degrees of freedom 15. So I go degree to freedom, degrees of freedom 15. I slide across here. I'm looking for 0 0.005. I'm finding it. 2.947. T with a tail probability 0 0.005 is 2.947 from the tables. I'm looking right at it. Degrees of freedom 15. So that's okay. And then uh, we know S is 3.96, N is 16. We did it. Okay, all the pieces are good. I get the margin of error. It's 2.917. And then we have the actual interval. So this says mu is likely between 18.71 and 24.55. It's talking about the population mean being between 18.71 and 24.55. And it's a 99% confidence interval, so uh, we're more sure than usual because 99% of the time this covers the true value. That's 99%. So in 99% of samples, the value of the mean, the value of the standard deviation are such that when you compute this, you get an interval that contains the true population mean. Okay. And over here, just a few comments about t-intervals in general. Um, since if the population is normal, the interval is valid for very small sample sizes, but probably not useful for n less than 5. Uh, so you can verify the population is normal by finding a normal probability plot for uh, medium-sized samples. Maybe uh, n bigger than, say, maybe 10 or something like that, some small number. So there's, you can see a pattern to the probability apply. If it's too small, it's going to be hard to do. And so if you knew the population was normal, so if n is less than 5, the probability plot's not going to tell you what you need to know. Uh, but you might know in advance you're sampling from a normal population, n is less than 5. Uh, what happens there, though, is since that number is in the denominator, the size of the interval becomes so large, it might not be useful to you. So it might be so big that it's not giving you information that you can use for anything. Uh, okay, that's one thing. And then uh, if the population is not normal, you can use the interval. You can with some other conditions. So if n is at least 15, no outliers of strong skewness, doesn't have to be symmetric, doesn't have to look normal. Just no outliers or strong skewness. So um, anything that's basically a lump of data with doesn't have outliers and doesn't seem to have strong skewness, any shaped lump you can think of. And if n is bigger, bigger than, sorry, at least 40, if n is at least 40, uh, almost always, you'd, you would uh, look at the histogram of the data and go, well, it's not insanely skewed. There's not an outlier that's of size 2,000 when most of the values are near 100. And so extreme outliers and extreme skewness can mess things up, but it's pretty hard. With 40, you can just use it. 
almost without thinking. Of course, you never do these things without graphing the data anyway, so that, that would be the point of caution. See if it's reasonable to use, it, to use the procedure by just looking at a plot of the data, a histogram, a stem plot, or something that can tell you the distribution of the sample you have, and see if it looks at all reasonable for what you want to do. Uh, because of this, we say T procedures are robust, meaning normality is not always needed. So I don't have to look at a normal probability plot with these sample sizes. I can just look at a histogram and go, hey, it meets the condition. With the, I have a sample size at least 15, or I have a sample size at least 40. So I don't have to worry about exact normality or a straight line on the probability plot. So that's why we call them robust. And then uh, here's the sample size calculation. It can be estimated by this quantity. So you take your critical z value, you take the sample standard deviation, you divide by the margin of error, and you square that and that gives you the sample size. So it's a similar calculation that we did with the proportion confidence intervals where there was a formula for sample size and bumping, squaring some stuff, these types of things. Now this wasn't in there. There was uh, p hat times one minus p hat playing the role of s squared here. Uh, but there is a sample size calculation like that. All right, so we're trying to finish off this section, but we're not done, I don't think. So I'll be back in a minute with the rest of this.